Computers. What are they? How do they work? And if computers are so good, why hasn't there been a sequel to them yet? Today I will be explaining all those questions and more through a format called the iceberg chart. If you've never heard of that format before, don't worry, it's really simple. Here's an image of an iceberg with all of the topics I'll be going through in this video. The lower we go, the more obscure and complex the topics will be. This is the computer science iceberg explained. Okay, I'm not going to waste your time too much. You probably already know what a website is, but unless you've done your research, you might not know how your computer retrieves them. So let me tell you. First, you have your browser. This is a program that does all the technical stuff for you so that you only have to tell it where to go. On your computer, it's probably Google Chrome or Safari, maybe Firefox, whatever. They all do the same thing. Let's say you want to go to google.com. It's a bit of a small website. I don't know if you've heard of it before. On its own, the domain name doesn't really say anything about where the website is. Instead, your computer needs to find the IP address. To do that, your browser takes your request for google.com or whatever other website you were going to and goes to your local DNS server. DNS server then takes your request for google.com and finds whatever IP address matches the domain and sends it back to your computer. When I say computer, I also mean phones and any other device with the browser. Now that your browser knows the IP address of the server it wants to access, it now knows where the server hosting the website is. More specifically, the browser can now ask your internet service provider to connect you to the server with the IP address. Your browser then establishes a connection with the server that hosts the website. Yo, what's good, hey, bro? Hey, not much. What about you? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Hey, can I get those files? Oh, of course. Here you go. All right, thanks. Have a great day. All right, you too. Okay. Your browser now has all the files it needs to display the website. And now comes the part where your computer needs to work a little since it has to go through every single file it has just gotten from the website to figure out exactly how the website should look. The first file is the HTML file. This is just relatively simple information about what to display, like text or buttons or forms or whatever. Then there's the CSS, which is used to describe the style of the website, like what color the text should be, or how large the button should be, etc. And then maybe there's a JavaScript file that contains some code that your browser should run. Whew, there, I'm done. You happy? Finally, after all those steps, the website loads, and you can now you see and you, use the website. And of course, as soon as you access no. a different page, the entire process no, repeats again. Mother More or less anyway, in practice, a lot of different methods like caching have been invented to make this process a lot faster and easier. If you've ever been on the internet, there's a very high chance that you've been offered some cookies. But what the hell is a cookie, what are they used for, and why can't I eat them? In short, cookies are a small file that websites can give to the client, typically used to store some sort of information that is personal to the user. So for example, say you're logged into a website like uh, YouTube, you know, the, the video streaming platform? I don't know if you've heard of it. Anyway, when you click on a video, your browser sends a request for that specific page of YouTube.com, and so the website won't really know who you are. To fix this, websites typically use what is called a session cookie, which acts as a form of single-use password for that session to identify the user. If it weren't for these cookies, you would have to log in every single time you did anything on a website. But cookies can be used for many other things like storing your settings and preferences, but are also very often used for tracking the user's behavior and is often sold off to companies who use them to, among other things, personalize their advertisements. So perhaps more realistically when you access a website. Yo, what's up? Hello, what can I do for you to- Oh, what's up, EpicGamer294? Long time no see! I was literally here 2.3 seconds ago. Anyway, do you got the files? Uh, yeah, sure, here you go. Okay, what is this? Just a few cookies, nothing... A few? Are you absolutely... Favorite background color? Number of times I've visited... What? Make sure to bring every one of them back, please. Just so we can... All of them? Yeah. Even tracking cookie number 29? I mean... What do you even do with this? Don't worry, we don't sell your data to anyone. Well, then why we do you... We use it ourselves. <laughs> what the... The term indexed web is used to describe the part of the internet that you can access using a standard search engine like google.com. The deep web is all the stuff that can't be found using Google. Files like that email you accidentally sent to early can't be found by searching on Google, they are somewhere on some server. That file is a part of the deep web. How does a computer compute? I mean we took some sand, put some electricity through it and now it runs Minecraft? Magic. Okay, that's not true. Let's have a look at the part of the computer that does the work, the CPU. 
If we zoom all the way in, we see these. This is a transistor. Pretty cool, right? No, not really, not in its own anyway. A transistor functions a bit like a switch, on or off, one or zero. If you combine some of them, you can create logic gates. These things are at the lowest level of the CPU hierarchy. If you combine some of these gates, you can start to do basic math like adding or subtracting numbers together or comparing numbers. These things are called instruction sets and are built into the CPU. So now we have some sand that can respond to the electricity we put into it. Now all we need is a system to figure out how we send and receive these instructions and before we know it, we now have a system that can do maths, I guess? So really, all that just to do maths? Right, well, okay, you have to understand that all software is just a bunch of math instructions for the CPU. Let me just continue, okay? It'll all make sense, just- Yeah, okay, sure, just go, okay. So, we add a system that can control where the input and output to our CPU goes, and then we add some memory to the CPU. You know, some RAM so that we can store what instructions to execute and when. Finally, let's create a language for these instructions. And boom, a computer, finally. Now that we have a computer and a set of executable instructions to go with it, we can start to write Minecraft? No, no god no. No, coding stuff like that in machine code is practically impossible. I mean look, good luck coding Minecraft like this. No, to make it easier to code, some smart people have invented what we call an assembly language, which turns this into something more human readable. This allows us to code, code Minecraft? No, well, I mean, technically, yes, it is possible to code complex programs and assembly languages, but in the case of Minecraft, it's actually made in Java. Basically, most software is written in languages like C, Java, Python, or any of the other millions of languages out there, which builds upon assembly languages in various ways to abstract a lot of the work of programming, which makes it a lot easier and faster to code. And there you have it. Keep in mind that this is a simplified version of how it works, okay? This is this is more complex in real life. Good? Good. But let, let's proceed. This number... <sighs> this number was randomly generated by my computer. But how? I mean, inherently, computers follow precise instructions. How could something that's made to do exactly what it's told produce something random? Well, the short answer is that it can't. Not in its own anyway, the long answer is that it depends on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. So how do computers create random numbers then? Well, let's have a look. We can't just create an algorithm to generate a number from nothing, so we need some sort of input. It honestly doesn't really matter what we use as input, so some computers just use the time as input, which works fine. Somehow, this input needs to be turned into a completely different number. Most random number generators use some variation of the middle square method, where you take your input, square it, and then remove some of the digits, then you take this number and repeat the process a couple of times. In practice, this method has its problems. What you might have realized is that this isn't technically random. If you ran it again with the exact same input, it would output the same results. This method of using some input to generate a seemingly random number is not random, but pseudo-random. Basically meaning that for all intents and purposes, it's random enough so that you can't really predict the output if you don't know the input and the algorithm. But it's still not truly random, is it? If we want true randomness, we need some part of our generator to be actually truly random. We obviously can't have a randomized algorithm since computers undergo this peculiar phenomenon called following instructions and doing exactly what they're told. So instead, if we want true random, we need the input to be truly random. Getting a random input is quite difficult though, because defining the word random is quite difficult. Websites like random.org measure atmospheric noise to get random input. Let's say you're a developer, coding your website. You're making a sign-up feature so that users can make an account. Easy, no problem, barely an inconvenience. Take the password and the email of the user signing up, and store it in the database so that the next time the user wants to log in, they can just provide both of those and get access to their account, right? No, stop it, what are you doing? Is this the 90s? Have you lost your marbles? Never ever just put the passwords in a database without hashing it first, you absolute f So, what is hashing? I'm glad you asked. Right now, if someone gets access to your database, they can see all of the passwords and emails of every single user on your website. That is not good. What we do here in the post-Stone Age world is that we take the passwords and run it through a one-way function that obfuscates the input, turning it into something completely new. This is called hashing. Here's the trick. 
Because this function is irreversible, I'll get to that concept in a second, even if someone hacks your website and has complete access to the database, they won't be able to just retrieve the passwords of every user on your site. They will be obfuscated and impossible to decode, unless you brute force your way through every combination. Well, mostly anyway. Now, when someone logs into your site, they'll insert their password, the password will be hashed, and the hash will be compared with the hash that was saved in the database. Fascinating, right? So how does it work? How do we create irreversible one-way algorithms? Well, there are many different hash functions out there that all work in different ways, but the one that is perhaps used the most nowadays is SHA, which stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. Quite possibly the most generic name you could give a hashing algorithm, but I digress. Now, of course, I'm not going to explain how SHA works because that would be way too complex and psych. I'm going to do it anyway. Let's use some random text as an example. Okay, thanks, Shooter. Step one, take your input, convert it to binary. Step two, keep adding zeros until it's the nearest multiple of 512 bits, but reserve 64 bits. Step three, use the 64 reserved bits to describe the length of the message. Step four, separate your data into chunks of 512 bits. Step five, separate your chunk into portions of 32 bits. We call these portions words, and you currently have 16 words, but you need 64 words. You need 48 more words, which is why we need Step six. Use your existing words and some wacky rotational function to create 48 more words. Time for the main hash function. This is where the magic happens. Step 7. Find the square roots of the first few prime numbers. Step 8. Take the fractional parts of them and multiply them by 2 to the power of 32. Step 9. Convert them to binary. Step 10. Use some wacky compression algorithm to smush the square primes with the words. Step 11. You now have a set of 16 hash words. Convert them to hexadecimal, add them together, and boom, you're done. It couldn't be easier. And also, I probably just lost 90% of my audience there, but whatever. At least I still got you. Right? Right? Hello? Anyone watching this still? Data storage. Pretty important part of computers and just information technology in general, so let's have a look at how data is stored, shall we? One of the first ways to store data was on paper. But okay, that isn't computer science, so we'll just fast forward put a few thousand years to the early slash mid 19th century. Okay. This fellow by the name of Charles Babbage had the idea to use paper with holes in it called punch cards for his new and fancy mechanical computer, creatively called the Babbage engine. Punched cards had actually already been used in looms in the beginning of the 18th century and... Okay, you know what, I'm not gonna explain looms, okay, back to Babbage. These punched cards, though originally used for looms, and then by Babbage in his computers, would actually remain as the dominant way of storing data for computers even after the invention of electronic computers. Though, after the electronic computers became more popular, magnetic tapes started to replace punched cards. But in the years to follow, many different technologies would be invented for storing data. Shortly after magnetic tape was used in computers, magnetic disks were invented and are still very commonly used to this day because they have continued to improve since their invention. You probably have a magnetic disk hard drive in your device right now. But how does a magnetic disk hard drive work exactly? I mean, how do you store cat images and a round disk of metal? What the dog? Well, inside the hard drive, there's a stack of metal disks called platters. Each of these platters is plated with a thin film of magnetic material divided into billions of really tiny areas. And I do mean tiny here. Each of these areas can be in one of two magnetic alignments corresponding to either a one or a zero. Binary. The disk is then rotated a few thousand rounds per minute, and right above it is a read and write head that can read and change the magnetic alignments of the different areas. And again, I do mean right above, it's literally about 5 to 10 nanometers above the disk. Let's say you have a computer capable of doing maths, and you want to render a 3D object like a sphere. How do you do it? Well, the answer is math, so that shouldn't be a surprise by now. Keep up. How do we approach such a problem? Well, we can start by copying the real world. We can simulate every light beam emanating from a light and see where it hits, just like how light works in real life. And that works, but the amount of time that would take to render is just absolutely staggering. What we can do instead is go the other way. Instead of simulating beams of light emanating from a light source, we go through each pixel of the camera and simulate a beam of light going from it, seeing if it hits a light source. This is ray tracing. You might be surprised to hear that this technique was first invented on paper in 1968 and was among the first computer rendering techniques invented. But it was only in 1978 that this technique, which was named ray casting, began to be used and experimented with seriously. This image here was made in 1979 by Scott Roth. But as I said earlier, ray tracing is very resource intensive, and so if you wanted to render something quickly, or if you just 
didn't have a supercomputer, you were going to have to find some other way to render a 3D object. And so, a few other techniques came about to basically simulate the way light works without all those fancy expensive tracings. Before I continue, let me just tell you about how the 3D objects are defined. At its core, every 3D object is just made of a bunch of polygons. Sometimes triangles, but it can also be what I call quads. It depends on what we are doing. This is done to break down complex 3D shapes into very simple geometric shapes that we can use to do maths on. So actually, when we make a 3D sphere on a computer, we really just get a bunch of triangles and put them together in the shape of a sphere. Got it? Okay, back to rendering. What we can do is that we can go to each triangle and then calculate its lightning level depending on where it is compared to the light. The issue with this is that, well, this sphere looks kind of fractured, doesn't it? It's not smooth. This is flat shading. You can very clearly see the differences in lighting between each triangle. What we can do to fix this is that we can take each triangle in our 3D object, take the three corners of the given triangle and calculate their own levels of lightning so that we can blend these three values across the triangle, if that makes sense. So now, rather than having one triangle with one flat color, we now have a triangle that is pretty much like a gradient. So let's apply this to our sphere and... Wow, that's a lot better. In fact, you might not even have noticed that this is just a bunch of triangles if it weren't for the fact that you can see it on the edges. Anyway, this technique of shading was first invented in 1971 by Henry Gu... Henry Gu... This technique of interpolating color values was developed upon further and new shading methods like Fong shading were invented in 1973. In the years to come, these shading techniques would become more complicated and allow for a lot more things than just color and brightness. But while the first instances of 3D rendering might have happened in the early 70s, it would take a while before we saw the first 3D being used in media like animated movies or video games, mostly because of the whole most people don't have a supercomputer thing. In the beginning of the 80s though, there were a few simple 3D arcade games like Battlezone, but real 3D in video games wasn't really used and explored until the 90s. Once again, because of the whole, most people don't have a supercomputer, you, you get it. In the 1990s, there were a few experiments with real-time 3D rendering in video games. The most popular of these was perhaps Wolfenstein 3D, which worked by using the ray casting we talked about earlier. Well, 2D ray casting. Basically, rather than tracing a ray for every pixel on the screen in two dimensions, you would only trace a ray for every pixel in one dimension. Say you have a wall. The distance between the wall and the camera for every given ray would determine the height of the line of pixels. Like this. This gives a fascinating illusion of 3D, and this is also how Dune worked, albeit it was a bit more complicated. A few years later, in 1992, real polygon-based 3D rendering would appear for arcade games, and a few years later, consoles with 3D-focused hardware like the PlayStation and the Nintendo 64 started to hit the shelves. Simultaneously, video games like Quake in 1996 would also popularize 3D games for the computer. Today, we've started to use ray tracing for real-time applications like video games, as we now finally have enough computational resources to run this equation multiple times per pixel for every pixel on your screen multiple times a second. Machine learning. One of those hot buzzwords like big data and blockchain, but what is it? Let's say you want to make a program that can analyze images to find out if there's a smiley face on them or something. What you can do is that you can write an algorithm that analyzes an image for the exact things that make up a smiley, like detecting a face, looking for a mouth and so on. The issue with this approach is that it's extremely hard to write a program that can reliably detect any smiley face on an image. What if the smiley face is in a 3D perspective so the proportions are all changed? Or if it's on the edge of an image and your program doesn't know where to look? When you look at an image, you can easily tell that this is a smiley face and that this isn't. It's hard to tell exactly what a smiley face is to a computer, but you know it when you see it. This is where machine learning comes in. Rather than having to figure out exactly what defines a smiley face yourself, you give your computer a bunch of images of things that are smiley faces and things that aren't smiley faces. Your computer then goes through each image, tries to analyze it, and makes a guess as to which images contain smiley faces and which ones don't. At first, it'll guess correctly about 50% of the time, as it guesses pretty much randomly, but eventually it might start to find the right patterns and increase its success rate. I want to note that I just described one specific type of machine learning. Machine learning has many different forms and just refers to when a machine learns. Anyway, the uses of machine learning go beyond looking at images of smiley faces. 
obviously. I mean, say you're a company and you want to maximize the amount of time your user spends on your app. Or what if you want to create a self-navigating, self-driving car? All these problems and many more would be incredibly hard to solve by manually making the algorithms, but as long as there is some pattern that can be analyzed or some other similarity between the things you're looking for, you can apply machine learning. You've probably heard that computers use binary for everything, right? But how is binary, these zeros and ones, used to store text and numbers and images and videos and everything else at the same time? To give a short answer, every type of data, text, numbers, whatever, has its own set of rules for how the bits are supposed to be used. Some data types are quite simple, like the boolean, which only has two values, true or false. Then there's the integer, which is also somewhat simple. Basically, the numbers we are used to in the real world are in base 10, which means that we have 10 different digits we can combine. Computers use binary, which is base 2, where there are only two digits. Let's take a random binary number as an example. How it works is that the value of the first bit is 1, the value of the second bit is 2, then 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and so on. The values of all the placements of the 1s are added together, and from that we can derive the value in base 10. If you want to save text, you can use the string data type. Essentially, every character is given a number value, so for example, the character uppercase Q could be this in binary, which is actually just the number 81. Some encodings like UTF-8 support many different characters, including things like emojis. You are using Napster to download Britney Spears' Baby One More Time, or playing Quake 3 and Half-Life or something. The year is 1999 and the date is December 31st. You and your friends are looking at the time because soon your clock will go from this to... Well that's the question isn't it? Currently your clock is just displaying the last two digits of the current year, that is 99, but what will happen when the year becomes 2000? Will the clock think that we're in the year 1900? Okay, but who cares about your clock? What will happen to everything else? What will happen to computers? And what about airplanes and satellites? Will they just adjust themselves using data from the year 1900? That was the year 2K problem. Now, luckily, nothing major really happened on New Year's Eve of 1999, mostly because a lot of resources had been invested to prevent Year 2K from becoming a problem. Actually, somewhere between 150 to 225 billion US dollars were allegedly spent on averting Year 2K in the US alone, and though many remember it as the disaster that never happened, we shouldn't forget the amount of work that was done on checking out the tons of 20-year-old computer systems. You're using Mlinga to download Music Guy 23's new hit single, or playing Minecraft 2 or something. The year is 2038 and the date is January 19th. You and your friends are looking at the time because... Okay, this is confusing, let's just go back in time. So, today, quite a few computer systems keep track of the time by using a signed 32-bit integer that represents the number of seconds that have passed since January 1st, 1970, called the 32-bit Unix time format. What does that mean? Well, you remember how I explained integers before, right? Yeah, so the number of bits we use to store an integer is predetermined. This means that for every integer, there's a maximum value we can store. In the case of 32-bit integers, if the first bit is used to determine whether the integer is positive or negative, the maximum number it can store is 2 to the power of 31, or numerically, 2,147,483,648. Now, you might already be piecing this together, but basically at some point about this many seconds will have passed since the year 1970, and we won't be able to store a higher date using 32-bit Unix time. This will happen on January 19th, 2038. And there you have it, the year 2038 problem. So, what is gonna happen? Well, I mean, we don't know. The 32-bit Unix time format isn't used that often in most newer systems, and we have about 16 years to check on the systems we use today, but a lot of software updating and system checking will have to be done if we want to be completely safe. And that's it for part one. Thanks for sticking around. If you liked the video, good for you. Uh, I'd like to thank Coda, the creator of icebergcharts.com, for coming up with some of these entries. Uh, sorry for the lack of uploads these last few months. I wish I had a good excuse, but to be completely honest, I was just lazy. My next video will probably be something that won't take as long to make, so be on the lookout for that, maybe. Uh, also join my Discord server if you'd like.